good evening professor karthik i think it's an evening over there it's a pleasure to have you give a talk uh, at our research symposium so we have been chasing you for really long and finally glad that we got it at least in an online mode so wish you could come to flame it's a very beautiful campus so you would really enjoy it so next time please make sure like visit our campus so your work has gone into many of my classes on education policy even policy implementation evaluation and also urban governance okay so some of our students uh, policy majors and economic students they have also joined sigis so prachi agarwal and sonika tandon so i think that sell something <clears throat> how they got inspired by you and decided to join your organization so i've listened to many of your podcasts and interviews it's first time i'm able to hear you so thank you for joining us so now madhukar will briefly introduce uh, you about the symposium objectives and uh, like then you can go on yeah perfect thanks thanks so much shiv and thank you kartik uh, sorry we were not able to have you in person but i think as uh, professor shiv kumar was introducing i think the idea of this research symposium hosted by the flame university and leadership equity is to really get the academicians in india talk about like the some of the pressing issues of school education right and uh, as as we speak i think we are you are going to be speaking to a good 100 uh, 120 member crowd a mix of sort of uh, uh, philanthropists a mix of csr heads academicians professors from different universities coming together and also practitioners from the ngo community in india uh so i think i'm going to jump straight in uh to ask you the first question and then maybe once you're sharing i think we'll come back but i think broad level thinking about this universalization of quality education in india right and i and i've heard you before you've said the two binding constraints seems to be pedagogy and governance and you went ahead and also spoke about these three sort of key pieces where a lot of effort needs to go in i think one is just the capacity of the state and the system to be able to deliver i think the research which is much more focused on outcomes and also reorganizing of resources influenced by that data so having these three what are some of the things that you've been learning across uh, just from all the different work you've been doing in india and abroad i think we could start off with that to hear your initial thoughts on the topic uh thank you so much thank you madhukar thank you shiv for the invitation and again it's my personal loss that i'm not able to be there um for the audience i had planned to come and then a bunch of um uh, personal uh, circumstances that were unplanned uh, uh, showed up and i've you know not been able to come in person so if i was there in person i would have probably given about a 25 to 30 minute lecture summarizing some of the main insights from recent work um mm, and i'll probably take uh, you know a similar uh, similar structure of 20 minutes so you know i think the big picture on education research mm, if i were to just reflect on the 20 years of my own journey here right i mean is you know there was a lot of work i had done in terms of research in the 2000s and then mm, at the time of the 12th five year plan i had written a background paper that synthesized a lot of that evidence with regard to you know what we're learning from the research and what that means with regard to our policy priorities in school education and i think you know what's been clear to people who are looking at the data in this area for a long time is just the the central importance of foundational literacy numeracy right i mean the fact that you know children if half your kids can't read by the end of grade 3 i mean then for all practical purposes their education is over um and you know there's these well known <clears throat> kind of graphs about just the gap between uh, student learning levels right i mean and where you know and 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 where they are um you know i could come back and in fact if i have some time i'll show that um but you know i think we all agree now mm, this is something that had been put in the 12th plan it lost a little bit of momentum it's come back in the nep so the good news is at least as a country we've kind of at least zeroed in on the importance of foundational literacy and numeracy that you simply cannot achieve universal quality education for all if half your children can't read okay so so the good news is at least um in terms of the policy priorities in the net it's very clear that this is a top priority um it's also then given that in a government for a priority to translate into something concrete you need projects you need missions you need funding and so you know it has mm, gone to that next stage from just being a, a goal of the nep to something that is being implemented through mission nipun bharat under which there is a certain amount of clarity on what the uh, standard should be with regard to not just mm, you know literacy numeracy but also with regard to fluency um there's also increasing alignment with regard to pedagogy um creating of the structured worksheets and the content and the scaffolding that reflects you know a certain amount of the science um, mm, 
the rigor, the scientific rigor on pedagogy itself, um, that, you know, there is, there's been this tension in the education community between kind of one extreme, which is highly scripted learning where you, you know, the teacher really just recites what's on a script and the other end where you have kind of this completely autonomous teacher figuring out what to do in the class. And as all, as is usually the case, I mean, there's always kind of a heated debate from the two extremes, but what works best is something that's in the middle, right? You don't want the teacher being an automaton who's repeating things like, I mean, that's in a script. At the same time, there is, it is simply not possible for an individual teacher to kind of reinvent best practice that can, you know, come from careful research and kind of structured content that reflects some of this evidence and research. So to the extent that we know that a certain style of lesson planning, certain amount of scaffolding in learning works, having that translated into worksheets so that teachers just have the material that they need to be able to more effectively transact in the classroom. I think a lot of this is happening under Mission Nippon Bharat. Okay, so this is all the good news. Now, what are the things that I think are still mm, where we still need to pay a lot of attention, where I think not enough has been done. Um, and I think the first and most basic thing is just the centrality of independent measurement of outcomes to make sure that all of this effort is in fact meaningfully accelerating our progress towards universal mm -hmm foundational literacy and numeracy. And, you know, if you just look at the Pratham data over the past 15 years, I mean, it is actually quite depressing in the sense that the time series in, in language is kind of modestly improving in math. There's almost no improvement over 15 years. And so <clears throat> the first warning here is that bureaucracies are very, very good at converting grand kind of well excellent goals into a bunch of schemes and inputs and that then becomes an end in and of itself right I mean so you know you have a scheme and when a principal secretary takes a review meeting with the district collectors or the district education officers the review meeting is almost always on measures of scheme implementation right I mean have the materials reached have the toilets been built and whatever is the current scheme that is being focused on but without visibility on learning outcomes you can get a lot of activity that doesn't necessarily translate into the outcomes we care about. And mm, let me give you kind of, you know, two recent studies that just uh, reinforce this point. Uh, the first is this large scale study on a school governance reform in Madhya Pradesh um, called Shala Gunvatta that then became, was the basis for Shala Siddhi, which is a national, you know, program with regard to school governance, has a very detailed and well thought out rubric for school assessments for the creation of school improvement plans. So the theory of change was excellent, right? It was an excellent theory of change, which had, you know, principles of Japanese Kaizen management and everything looks great on paper, right? Which is when you think about why do poor performing organizations continue to perform poorly? <clears throat> You can think of a taxonomy of four reasons that you you perform poorly because you don't know you're doing poorly. You don't you know you're doing poorly, but you don't know what to do about it. You know you're doing poorly. You know what step is you all of these three are in place, but success depends on other factors and other actors outside your control. And so the program is in fact designed to address each one of these things that you have an independent assessment and a self-assessment that gives you school diagnostic. You're then supposed to create a school improvement plan that guides you on what you need to do. There is then supposed to be quarterly follow-up on that plan. And then there is supposed to be greater engagement with the community and with the CRCs so that, you know, people are able to come together to solve the problems. Now, the amazing thing is like, you know, the on, on paper, the program looks beautiful. And if you looked at the dashboards that were being monitored, it actually looked very, very successful. OK, because the assessments were being done, the school improvement plans were being uploaded. But what this high quality independent evaluation that we did first over two years and then mm, over four years, you know, what we see just like it's stunning, right, which is basically nothing changes, okay, absolutely nothing changes in the classroom, and there is zero impact on learning outcomes. So here is a program that is scaled up to 600,000 schools across the country as a flagship school governance intervention, but basically has no impact at all, though on paper, it looks super successful. And so what this teaches us is that and however well intentioned we may be, right, that the system fundamentally bureaucratic incentives focus on the appearance of activity rather than the consequence of that activity. Okay, and this is not in any way criticizing any individual. This is just the characteristic of the system itself. Okay, and so the first and most important thing. <clears throat> If we want to make sure that this momentum around FLN is not lost, I think we have to absolutely pay attention to independent measurement and monitoring of learning outcomes in ways that are mm, use technology, are scalable, and are providing real time feedback. Because, um, so let me show you the bad news and then come back to the good news. Okay, so the bad news means so here's a simple, very striking slide from 
a study by my colleague um, Abhijit Singh. And, you know, this is in the same Madhya Pradesh context where we were doing this study. And it just, you know, occurred to Abhijit that, hey, here is Pratibha Parv, which is supposed to be a nationwide best practice with regard to measuring student learning outcomes. In fact, I think Niti Aayog in 2015 or 16 had a, a nice booklet on best practices in different sectors. And this was one of their best practices on learning measurement. Okay, so... And basically every student was being tested every year and the competencies were being measured and they were getting a grade. And this was, you know, this was a best practice. Now, basically what Abhijit does is he takes that official data and then he takes a random subset of the same questions and retests the same kids within six weeks of that original test. And, and what you see in this picture is just striking, right? I mean, it's kind of both striking and staggeringly scary. And basically what you see is that that red line is what's in the official data, okay? So in Hindi, so this is the organizing the kids from the weakest to the strongest. And you see that in the official data, there is no learning crisis. There is no child in the official data who's scoring under 70%, okay? But in the independent retest of the same kids and the same questions, you basically see that mm, there is essentially less than 20% of kids who are scoring over 60%. Okay, so the true, and what is amazing is actually, and it confirms the fact that the Indian system is very sensitive to ranking. Okay, so the ranking of the kids does not change. So the teachers kind of know that rank matters, but the levels are inflated. Okay, like, I mean, and they're inflated by a huge factor. So, and this is an example of how we've wasted 15 years as a country, right? Because you can have Pratham coming along and saying that there's a learning problem, but the official government machinery, like I mean, doesn't necessarily accept the external data and and kind of uses its internal data. And in the internal data, things are looking great, okay? So, and um, if you look at math, right, I mean, it's even worse, where literally nobody seems to score over 40% I mean, on this test, okay? Now, this is very depressing, but this is kind of, mm, like I said, there's two reasons to be optimistic, okay? The first is that, so by the way, this is not just kind of picking on education in Madhya Pradesh. This is true in every state and every sector, okay? So in my forthcoming book on state capacity, which will be out later in November this year, I have this whole chapter on data and outcome measurement where I talk through these issues and really talk about how do you build a systemic framework to strengthen measurement systems at scale. But but one piece of kind of uh, optimism here is the, the 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 fudging in the data, it reflects three things, okay? So it's not just that the teachers are fudging. Some of it is just the kids are mechanically copying from each other. Some of this is then you are kind of mm, getting help by having the answer written on the board. And sometimes it is actually fudging at the time of the correction itself, okay? So what Abhijit then did working with Central Square Foundation, mm, they did an RCT in Andhra Pradesh where they basically compared paper-based testing, which is what this was, with tablet-based testing. And in the tablet, you essentially have a question bank of over a thousand questions and it's randomizing which question the kids are getting. Okay, so simultaneously, you know, so you can't copy from your neighbor because the questions are all different. You can't have the answer written on, in front because the questions are all different. And it's hard to fudge the data afterwards because it is being entered real time and then uploaded to the server real time. Okay, and so when you look at the treatment versus control, you can see that there's a 90% reduction in the kind of number of uh, scripts that are being flagged for cheating. Okay, so this just gives you an example. So we uh, earlier I've done work on say MindSpark and technology about, you know, the value of technology for pedagogy, but the value of technology for governance is perhaps as big. Okay, so, so I think, you know, the good news here is that it is possible with well-designed statistical algorithms for a third party outside the government to be, be able to do sample-based independent measurement that can you know, generate enough precision to start holding the whole system accountable for outcomes. So as you think about what are the most important things NGOs and CSRs should be doing in terms of getting outcomes at scale. Now, there's obviously an enormous amount that needs to happen within the classroom. <clears throat> And, you know, whether it's at the level of school leadership, at the level of teacher training. So all of that is important. But, you know, going back to what Madhukar was saying, that when the research highlights the centrality of pedagogy and governance, the pedagogy piece is critical, but the governance piece is what I feel is still missing. And that's kind of, you know, what I'm highlighting in this particular example. Okay. So, so that's, that's kind of this particular, you know, so that's, so let me stop sharing this piece. Okay. And let me give you more good news. Okay. So the second piece, um, mm, you know, which I think is, you know, where there's a lot of evidence that suggests that there are models that can work at scale, where we are not necessarily acting on them. And the, the second piece that's missing is just augmenting staffing, okay? So the elephant in the room with regard to quality of primary education in India is still the fact that your typical school is very small, like I mean, and has maybe 50 to 60 kids across five standards. And so even if you have two teachers, you have multi-grade teaching, like I mean, of two teachers handling five grades. And 
it's just humanly not possible to provide the kind of individual attention that is needed to make sure every child gets the instructional support needed to get to FLN. Okay, so there's no point just governing and measuring and saying you're not reaching the outcomes without then providing the resourcing needed to actually get those outcomes up. Okay, so the second piece of evidence I'm going to talk about are these two sets of studies, both in Tamil Nadu, uh, but both which have been incredibly successful. Um, and the first is mm, the study we did on COVID learning loss and recovery. So we happened to have this panel of nearly 20,000 children across four districts who we were following over a three or four year period. And so that allowed us to both quantify the amount of learning loss during COVID when the schools were shut and also look at the amount of recovery. But more importantly, the government of Tamil Nadu perhaps did the world's most ambitious COVID remediation, learning loss remediation program. So this is something that mm, you know, uh, that the finance minister and the economic advisory council made a big priority. And so they hired 200,000 volunteers, right? I mean, at the village level, uh, running this program called Illam Tedi Kalvi, which is literally education at your doorstep. And what it was doing was it was supplementing mm, and it was essentially 60 to 90 minutes of instruction between four and six o'clock in the evening. It mobilized the community. It had, you know, very, very high levels of participation. And the, the teacher or the, the akka or the didi was typically, you know, a young woman from the community, paid a stipend of just about thousand rupees a month. But, you know, even at that stipend, there were on average four applicants for every job. And the amazing thing, is that we find that, you know, ITK or Ilam Tedi Kalbi was just incredibly effective, right? I mean, so it was not only highly effective, it was highly cost effective and also significantly improved equity. And this is really important because the learning loss unsurprisingly increased inequality because the children with less educated mothers had less educational inputs at home. And so you saw a greater kind of divergence, but the recovery actually reduced that divide. And we show in the paper that this is almost certainly because ITK participation was progressive, that the poorer children, less educated mothers, children and children of government schools were much more likely to go to ITK and partly because the private school kids were going to tuition anyway, right? I mean, and so this was a community level after school program that was completely <clears throat> done, supported by the government, but done in partnership with the school, right? So this is not in any way one of those things of a school versus this kind of program. It more reflects the fact that given the scale of the challenge, we need to augment kind of instructional time in a way that, you know, supports first generation learners in ways that higher SES kids are able to get from private tuition, okay? So, um, so it was stunningly effective and um, the government had intended to do this for just one year up to 2023. And they've now based on the results actually extended the program to 2026. And, you know, my own long-term recommendation for a program like this is that even though it was conceived as a COVID response, it can absolutely continue as a long-term community-based supplemental instructional effort that, you know, just like high SES kids have private tuition, this is almost like a government provided subsidized kind of after-school program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and this is something that the prior uh, FM uh, Honorable PTR, you know, he, he said, he said, if you look at the learning literature, I mean, in the US, that a lot of the SES gaps between kind of high income and low income kids happen in the summer, not during the school year. And that's because in the summer, high SES kids have camps and other activities and low SES kids don't have that kind of instruction. So similarly, um, in India, you do a lot of things in the school, but the after school gaps are continuing to exist. And so this is a way of bridging some of those after school gaps. And so it's never going to be a substitute for school, but it can be a very powerful supplement that allows us to accelerate our kind of ability to deliver FLN at scale. Okay. And, and the reason this is really worth paying attention to is this is not some small NGO Run program. This was run by the government at scale, right? Delivered across, you know, the whole state, 200,000 volunteers reaching over 30 lakh children. Okay. So that's, I think, a very powerful study. And the other study I want to point attention to is. Mm, you know, this large scale randomized control trial we did also in Tamil Nadu, but this time focusing on preschool education in the Anganwadis. Okay. And so this was, um, and again, this is not rocket science, right? So the early childhood advocates have been talking about the need for an extra worker in the Anganwadis for the last 20 years, saying that, you know, you've got this one single worker who's overburdened with a combination of responsibility for preschool education and nutrition and home visitation and maternal counseling and maintaining 14 different registers. But <clears throat> You know, it's something that typically finance departments have been very wary of because of the budgetary implications. And so, but what we did was just, you know, run this large scale RCT across 320 Anganwadi centers, provide this extra, just half time worker, right? I mean, working a half day shift at about four hours a day. And mm, 
what you see is not only stunning impacts on preschool edge. So basically we see and we measure time on task in great detail and you see a doubling of instructional time and you see a substantial improvement in preschool learning. But what is even more kind of um, you know, a, a positive surprise, which we had not planned for, is we also found a significant improvement in the nutrition status of the kids who had stayed in, in enrolled in the Anganwadis. And that's because most likely you were freeing up the time of the existing Anganwadi worker to focus more on health and nutrition related tasks. And so, you know, what we estimate here is the rate of return on this investment using basic global benchmarks is about 12 to 20 times the cost. Okay, so that's the kind of if somebody as a private investor told you that here is an investment opportunity that's going to give you 12x, you know, 1200% return, people would be like, where do I put how can I invest as much as possible? And we're leaving these kind of low hanging fruit untouched, right? Because we're under investing in these key areas. So, you know, I think I'm probably out of time, like, you know, I mean, but maybe I'll just take another five minutes to just, you know, wrap up on a few key principles from all of this. I think the there are two or three principles I want to leave people with, right? I mean, which is that education is an incredibly complex subject. It requires so many pieces to come together, right? I mean, and the majority of the work is obviously done by people in the front line, by the teachers, by the principals, the people who are manning the schools. The value of research, I mean, is really to kind of help guide mm, our efforts that in a world of limited resources, you can often spend a lot of time and effort on things that seem kind of intuitive, seem that they should work. But if they don't work, then the value of the evidence is to kind of help us course correct quickly, right? So to give you a simple example, you know, uh, like Michael Kramer was my advisor and, and one of the three Nobel Prize winners in 2019, had this very, very famous study about impact of providing free textbooks in Kenya, right? I mean, where, you know, they provided the textbooks, but had zero impact on learning. And that kind of makes no sense, right? You're like, wait, you go to a school, you see that maybe 10 kids are sharing a textbook. Why would a textbook not have an impact? And then it turns out that they look at the data and see that the top 20% of kids do benefit from the textbook, right? I mean, but that's because the median kid could not read. And so if you can't read, how are you going to benefit from the textbook? Okay, now the point is that well-intentioned policymakers, right, often don't kind of... Mm, have full visibility of the binding, that the binding constraint may be somewhere else. So somebody could be complete well-intentioned and saying, how can you not give books, right? So I'm not saying don't give the books, but the point is the research then helps identify where the binding constraint is, right? And that binding constraint may not be obvious in kind of business as usual. So, you know, hang on, let me find this picture, which is, I think it's a well-known picture, but let me see if I can just grab this slide quickly and share this. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, so this is, this is the picture, um, which I'm sure many people have seen this, right? I mean, so this is, uh, yeah, so this is the picture that, you know, is coming from, mm, is coming from our work in Rajasthan using MindSpark. And the point here is not the Cal as a, from the perspective of improving outcomes, but it's from the perspective of just measuring what's going on, right? I mean, and so you see here that the average eighth standard child is actually at a fourth standard level in terms of maths, okay? So the value of the research is to kind of shed large scale systematic insights to say, here is where the binding constraints are. And you can do a lot of other things that seem perfectly logical, but may not give you the bang for the buck as as long as you're not alleviating a, bind, a, a binding constraint. So, you know, the value of the research, mm, the reason research and education is particularly important is that um, if I'm in the private sector, you know, I don't worry about how Toyota makes its cars because you're facing competitive market prices for both your inputs and your outputs. If you're not competitive, you'll get competed out. Whereas in a subject like education, the outcomes take so long, right? I mean, it's very, very, very difficult to know whether what you're doing is right or not. And it's also, there is no market test or accountability because you're kind of typically spending other people's money, okay? Like, I mean, so it's an area where research is especially important in terms of helping us guide the allocation of resources. And then the last kind of meta point I want to make is just mm, the centrality of cost effectiveness. And, you know, I think typically uh, people in education, in health, in a lot of these, you know, social sectors are often suspicious of economists, right? They're suspicious because they think of us as kind of, you know, I've heard terms used like misers and bean counters and scrooges, okay? Like, you know, but, you know, the truth is that when education activists in India or advocates say that we want 6% of GDP, 
That 6% of GDP is an OECD benchmark that the US and Europe managed to do, but that's because their tax to GDP ratio is double of ours. Their tax to GDP ratio is 35%, and we are sitting at half of that tax to GDP ratio at 18%. So if you measure India's education spending as a share of our budget, we are not actually, uh, we are not underspending on education relative to share of the budget, okay? But, so, but what is important is why, is cost effectiveness so important, right? So if you look at comparable countries, if you look at Vietnam, if you look at China, these are countries that have delivered dramatically better education outcomes than India, but they've not spent more than India. In fact, their education spending is often lower than India. And the key point about China and Vietnam, which Amartya Sen and Jean Dreza pointed out, is that teacher salaries are one third of what they are in the US, uh, what they are in India. And that is the biggest line item in the cost budget, right? <laughs> so 80 to 90% of your budget goes in the unconditional salary increases that happen through pay commissions. And we've got this massive RCT in Indonesia showing that even an unconditional doubling of pay has zero impact on outcomes. Okay, so this is not to say that teachers should not be paid well. I think it's important to pay well, but it's also important to say that mm, you've created a structure where essentially that the majority of the money is being absorbed, not just by salaries, but then now by pensions. If this kind of, if you go back to OPS and open up that monster, like, you know, there'll be even less money, like I mean, needed to kind of do the things that are needed. So the larger point I want to make is that cost effectiveness is not just something that the economists have to care about. Cost effectiveness is a moral imperative, right? Because, you know, it's not just enough to say that I want more money for education, because you also have to say, where is that money going to come from? Is it going to come from health? Is it going to come from, you know, early childhood nutrition? Is it going to come from investments in public health? So given that we are at a tax to GDP ratio of 18%, we are spending the right amount in aggregate, right? So the real premium needs to be on finding interventions that are effective, that are cost effective, that promote equity and are also scalable. And, you know, we're starting to see evidence on a bunch of these things. And yeah, so, you know, I think there's a lot more work to be done. But as a broader education community, let me just kind of say that cost effectiveness cannot just be the concern of the finance ministry. Cost effectiveness is a moral imperative that has to kind of be at the center of advocacy efforts of people who are committed to the sector, because essentially reallocating money from less effective to more effective policies is going to allow us to dramatically improve outcomes at any given level of budget. So another way of saying this is that we wasted 15 years or 20 years in this kind of, you know, in this charade where everybody says we need more money. The finance department says we don't have the money. And then we use the lack of money as an excuse for not delivering. Okay. Like, I mean, whereas the right, um, the, if you look at what we're getting in education as a share of the budget, it's actually exactly what you would expect compared to other countries. So it's really upon the sector to kind of take cost effectiveness more seriously and start delivering more bang for the buck. Yeah, so maybe I'll stop there. Uh, I think you're muted, Shiv. Yeah, so if you have something more and you can go on. For yeah, no, no, I was just going to say, right? I mean, so this is not to say that there should not be more spending on education. All I meant to say is that it's really important that the marginal increases in spending be driven by evidence and be driven by cost effectiveness, because we are not spending on many things that are highly effective, partly because we have used up our fiscal space on things that are not effective, right? I mean, and so just bringing cost effectiveness and optimization of resources into the center of our discussion in education, I think is something that the entire sector needs to do. Yeah, thank you very much, Karthik. It was very insightful. So first thing, I think you brought out the role of uh, need for evaluation, bringing evidence to understand the right means to solve this education quality and equity problem. So especially the need for independent measurements are outcome and need to move out from output-centric approach to an outcome-centric approach. Okay. And also the last point, that you know, so what government measure should be cost effective and it's also a moral imperative. So these are extremely insightful. So moving on, so much of the evidence generation in elementary education has been uh, has been on the elementary education. So now the next step is moving towards universalization of elementary education, uh, sorry, secondary education. But what we know is uh, the government sector has limited presence in secondary education compared to the private sector. But the new education policy has brought out, you know, grand ambitions, you know, primarily like um, integrating vocational education and also like uh, <clears throat> dismissing the boundaries between different disciplines like art, science and humanities. 
So I know the evidence is thin on this, the kind of measures. So I have few questions regarding this. Do you think some of the measures just like, you know, integrating secondary education and skilling of the people, which is very much needed for our economy, you know, so are these guidelines are in the right direction? And second thing, so do we have the enough state capacity to bring out these reforms? And if not, like, you know, what is the roadmap to achieve some of these? Uh, yeah, no, so these are obviously, you know, very, very, very complex questions, right? So let me just first focus on the substance of what we know and what I think we need to be focusing on. And then there's obviously a separate question of state capacity and what is the most effective way to build that capacity, right? So I think, see, talking about skilling more generally and school to work transition, I think, uh, there's no question, right? I mean, that we are graduating, if you just play the numbers game of saying, you know, how many children are completing secondary school or how many children are even completing, you know, youth are completing college, you know, it's an open secret that only 20% of engineering graduates, right, I mean, are employable, okay? So even for supposedly the most premium stream that has the highest standards, you are essentially producing a bunch of paper wielding graduates without any meaningful skills, okay? So I think the centrality of putting skills and competences at the center of our education system, I think should not be controversial at all. I think the more subtle part is that skilling in the Indian context is usually associated with a trade, okay, like I mean, and with vocational skills, whereas I would broaden the definition of skills to say that, you know, even I mean, let's take something as simple as studying language, okay, so I remember going to a school once in eighth standard and looking at the Hindi exam. And essentially that Hindi exam is an exam that I would fail because there was nothing in that exam that tested my understanding of Hindi. It was essentially about rote learning and repetition of a bunch of text that was in that class's textbook. Okay. So, you know, what is said in this Pankti of this Kavita, as opposed to kind of testing your skills of comprehension, analysis, communication. Those are skills. That is not just academic, right? So even looking at the basis of our assessment in, in topics like math, maths and language to kind of move away from rote learning so that you cannot do well on this exam without having a skill. I think that is the lowest hanging fruit, right? Before we start thinking about all the complex changes we need to do with regard to changing the curriculum and changing content and changing subjects, I would start with changing the assessments, right? So if you change the assessment so that the pedagogical and assessment objective of middle school and high school starts becoming less on rote learning and more on conceptual understanding and being able to apply those concepts, that is probably the most important skilling investment you can make, right? Because that, see, when it, the, there is a huge kind of long, you know, long lasting debate in the education literature globally, right, about the merits of a more continental European higher education system, where you start getting tracked into more narrow things earlier, right, I mean, versus a more US based liberal arts education, where it's a broader based, you know, uh, multiple subjects, multiple approaches, and then you specialize later, okay, and there is a strong argument for both now, but in general, you can see why there is a strong conceptual attraction of the US model, because you're going to be in the labor market for 50 years, the needs of the labor market are going to change. So you want to build a set of skills that will be flexible as opposed to narrow. So I think that's key. So the problem is normally we associate general education with flexible and vocational education with narrow, right? I mean, and so there's a concern of saying, okay, you know, when we think vocational or skills, we are normally thinking ITI, okay? Now that is certainly important, but I think there's a place to bring like a more general sense of skills, right? I mean, into our core education system itself, okay? So I think I would start with that because that will be one of the, I think Mani Sabarwal once said, right? The best skilling program is a higher quality school education system, right? I mean, so I think there's a lot we can do even within the confines of our existing schooling system to make sure that we are better preparing our youth in terms of the flexible general skills. So what are the flexible general skills, right? It's analytical skills, it's communication skills, it's comprehension skills. And these are things that one should be able to assess, you know, through well-designed assessments in maths and science and language, right? Those are the core subjects for a reason. So anyway, that's kind of, you know, my way of saying that I strongly believe in skills, but I don't want that skills to be interpreted as kind of over narrowing the skills, but, you know, focusing on the general skills that will hold you in good stead, regardless of what you do. Okay. And then, of course, you know, I can talk more about the skilling ecosystem, which is not specifically about schools. But when I look at the skilling ecosystem in India, right, I mean, 
I think the biggest market failure, the biggest challenge is the following, right? Which is that there is so much variation in the quality of the skilling providers, okay? That if I am a uh, youth in the labor market and I come to an employer with a certificate saying that I have the skill, the employer has no credible signal of what level of skill I truly have, okay? Which means that the market is not willing to pay a wage premium for my skilling credential, okay? And as a result, what ends up happening is students will not be willing to pay for the skilling. So what sustains the entire skilling ecosystem is the subsidies that come from NSDC. So because there is money, like I mean, there are skilling programs that are provided and people are being paid and people are getting certificates. But is that creating jobs? We don't know because we're not solving the market failure with regard to the credentialing, the quality of the skilling providers, right? I mean, which is something I feel that industry can do a lot more. Sector skills councils were set up and supposed to do this, but my sense in general is there might be a few cases where it's working well, but in general, when I think about the skilling ecosystem in India, I don't quite know, like, I mean, how much we are investing in kind of credentialing the quality of the skilling providers so that when you have a candidate with a certain credential, that the market interprets this as meaning something. I mean, given that we haven't solved the problem for, say, engineering colleges, like, you know, clearly we haven't solved the problem at, at the level of skilling, but when I think structurally, right, those are some of the things I would want to see more attention paid to. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Karthik. And as we close out your session, my final question for uh, for you today is uh, uh, looking at, I, mean, I know you touched upon the nuances of measurement and state capacity, a bunch of these things. But I think education, as we know in India, is the problem in itself is so convoluted, right? It's multi-layered. It's not purely technical to say that we're going to fix certain issues inside the classrooms around best material, but it's also lack of a better word, it's hugely socio-political. And for those organizations who've been looking at solving this at a state level, even at a district level, like trying to get in all the uh, energy together, and many nonprofits today sitting in the audience are doing that, struggling, trying to sort of get in day in and day out. And of course, there's a huge support from the academia as well. So closing thoughts on just like really if the vision or, or collective sort of idea of universalization of this quality education what is your sort of a wish or a hope for the leadership both in the academia and universities in India and the nonprofit ecosystem in India who are trying to do this day in and day out? Yeah, it's a great question, right? I mean, and I think um, to that, I will add a third piece, which is kind of the philanthropic ecosystem, because so much of the nonprofit ecosystem in turn is limited and constrained by, right, like, I mean, what you're able to raise money for, right? And so I think the, so let me start with philanthropy, okay? Because in a way, mm, I think that is almost the easiest place to make the change just because, I mean, because there are even a few good philanthropists can have a disproportionate impact by, and I think many of them are already doing this, right? But the main plug I want to make is the following, right? Which is, see, there are two ways of thinking about philanthropy. There is kind of what I call additive philanthropy, right? I mean, and strategic or multiplicative philanthropy, right? Now, normally the bulk of philanthropy in India falls into what I call the additive class, okay? Which is government is not doing a bunch of things. So let me go and build an extra school. Let me go provide certain extra resources. Let me go provide like a, uh, provide some computers or provide some materials, right? I mean, so it is essentially saying, here is what we need to have a well-functioning school. The government is not providing everything. Let me come and fill that gap. Okay, and that fits very naturally with our traditional model of CSR and even kind of, you know, even private philanthropy, which tends to be local, right, because you kind of want to connect to the communities where your company is, you kind of want the certain warm glow and respect that comes from having a school with kind of, you know, a plaque with your name on it, right, like, I mean, that is, you know, that is standard philanthropy, right, I mean, it's not just true in India, it's true in every university in the world, okay, but I think the, the bigger opportunity right now, frankly, is the fact that the elephant in the room is kind of the government, and the government spends over 600,000 crores a year on education, right, I mean, and we get so little for it in terms of outcomes that if you think about the value of improving the effectiveness of government spending by even 1%, okay? So imagine, I mean, and in a way, this is partly what Pratham did, right? I mean, by on a shoestring budget, kind of making learning outcomes salient in the national agenda, I think they've probably been more successful than any other nonprofit in the space with regard to kind of making that salient. Now, the question today is, if you're a nonprofit who's committed to education, working even, say, at the level of a district, what are the investments you could make that would have the most leveraged impact, right? And the leveraged impact comes not from saying, let me go build two schools. It comes from thinking at a systems level and saying, okay, how do I make the entire public education system function better? So, 
The first step is kind of educating yourself with regard to how the system functions and then kind of saying what are the most leveraged entry points, right? So something as simple as saying, can and you know and all it takes is one collector or somebody who's committed enough to say i really care about learning outcomes here help me do a system of independent learning outcomes every year so that i can use that for goal setting and holding this entire system accountable right and so you know so one analogy i use in my book and in my chapter on measurement is like if you want to move an 800 megaton aircraft carrier okay that is sailing in the sea in some drifting away in some direction okay if you want to move this from the shore you can't can sometimes go and control the innards of the beast okay that is the government or the innards of the aircraft carrier but what you can do is you can move the lighthouse okay so if you move the lighthouse then this aircraft carrier will willy nilly start kind of drifting in the right direction relative to kind of the input based direction in which that aircraft carrier is drifting right now okay so if you come in, for example, at a level of a district and saying we're going to invest in independent sample based measurement that has every year this district, we're going to get representative estimates of learning outcomes that the whole system is going to hold itself accountable for. Then there are ways to do this with statistical sophistication that will allow you to then kind of get a fair bit of precision on the level of truth that is being reported. Okay, so that's just one example. Now, there might be other examples of very, very leveraged ways like I mean of mm, and sometimes it might be saying, you know, even this idea of saying putting an extra worker, right? So sometimes that could be something that a CSR, if you again think about it, you can you can build schools, but if the evidence shows that the physical building is not doing much compared to kind of augmenting the staffing, if that's a 10x ROI, that could still be something, right? I mean, that's worth doing in partnership with kind of a district administration. So the larger point I want to make is that there is additive philanthropy, which is saying here is what the government is not doing. Let me put some money to fill that gap. Okay. So, and in that model with 600,000 crores, you put in 1,000 crores of CSR, like the total budget is, you know, there's 601,000 crores worth of education spending okay but if that same thousand crores is allocated in ways that saying how do i improve the effectiveness of this public system by even one percent okay if you manage to do that then you're getting 600 six thousand crores a year and in present discounted value terms at even ten percent that's a sixty thousand crore npv which is a 60x roi okay so that is kind of the opportunity with regard to strategic philanthropy thinking about systems and you know it's not easy to do this obviously because you know it requires understanding the beast but you know that's i think a broad still I think for NGOs, I would say something similar, which is, again, there is a, there's an entire taxonomy of NGOs, right? I mean, which is you can work at local levels and that's very meaningful. This is not in any way to take away from the value of committed local NGOs that are adding value to their communities, right? I mean, and then, you know, there's a whole range, but to the extent that this conference has NGOs and others who are thinking about issues at, 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 at a systems level, at a scale level, you know, I think the main steer again is to say don't think about this additively think about this as what are the most leveraged interventions that can improve the effectiveness of public systems at scale okay so that's for ngos and then i think for academia you know and in some ways this is as much for students right i think sometimes we and you know we are all a victim of our own incentives right i mean and the incentive structure is often to publish papers right like i mean and kind of do very credible econometric research but for a public policy university like you know or particularly when you have undergrads or master's students you know master's students have enough analytical skills to be able to add an enormous amount of value to ngos and even governments right i mean just by being able to analyze existing data so government offices government departments are sitting with so much data that they have no idea what to do with Right. So having a professor like Shiv at Flame kind of build a relationship with kind of, you know, a set of collectors or a set of district education officers or whoever and saying, let's just look at your data. How can we help you function better? And here is a small team of students like I mean, that are going to work with the data. And so they don't have to publish papers, but they will kind of get enough insights for their own learning for class projects and that this will yield inputs and, out and outcomes that would be meaningful, you know, mm -hmm for the district administration. And sometimes if it's too hard to go and work with the government because there'll always be some risk averse guy saying, okay, I can't give you my data, right? Then at least building those partnerships with NGOs because NGOs are all typically, they mean well, but they are almost always subscale and don't have the resources to kind of have their own m and team, like I mean, or the two or three dedicated people who can analyze data because they're so small and everybody's kind of scrounging for budgets. So the universities, like I mean, the students are there waiting to learn, right? I mean, so, 
having structured partnerships with kind of a few academic entities with NGOs to saying, let's just create a system whereby I'm going to get five master students every year working on a set of projects. And so that's part of their learning. And from an NGO perspective, like, you know, what you should do is not just saying, okay, here's a bunch of free labor to create some PowerPoints for my donor, but to say, okay, listen, if I have this kind of, uh, if I have this committed human resource of three to five people or even one to two people who are able to analyze data, what as a CEO or a founder of an NGO are the kind of analytical questions I wish I had the answers to that will help me kind of run my org better. Okay, so as an NGO, what you owe to the student is that clarity with regard to what are the decisions I'm going to make that will be better if I have better analytical support. And once you've established the credibility that you can create a meaningful learning experience for the master student, that I think like, you know, can create a space for very, very productive collaboration. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kadi. Every time I think I hear you, it just so resonates with the kind of principles that we follow at Telephi and on the whole systems change approach. So thank you very much for just reiterating our own beliefs. And in fact, I'll be happy to in fact share on this forum that uh, LFE and Flame University have partnered. We're doing a longitudinal research on social emotional well-being of children. And Shiv, uh, in fact, Professor Shiv Kumar, in fact, has been very closely along with Professor Shalaka, have been looking into the data that we're doing from a third party way. So I think, yeah, it's a great example of the collaboration that one has to be having. But uh, no, I just want to thank you so, so much again. And I know we weren't able to have you in Pune. Hope to have you in Pune in Maharashtra sometime soon in person. Uh, but thank you so, so much for doing this uh, on, on a short notice. Uh, but Professor Shiv, if you any final thoughts and then uh, we can close out. Yeah, again, thanks. I think it was extremely insightful lecture. Like every time I hear you, you it's a very densely packed insight that comes out of it. So as I suggested, like, you know, we have been partnering with um, LFE and also with government, like, you know, Gujarat and Maharashtra and even Karnataka. I worked out with Karnataka government on small schools and school consolidation related stuff. Mm -hmm. It was extremely insightful. You know, they had a bunch of data, but their reports are generally just tables and tables, tables, you know, not insightful. So I think our students and, you know, faculty, we can partner with the NGOs, non-profit organization. I think that will be a great thing. And we'll convey this during the symposium also. Yeah. Yes. Thank Wonderful. You. And I, you know, and again, you know, for the record, nobody told me to say this. So I just said this on my own and it turns out that, <laughs> you know, that LFE and Flame were already doing this collaboration. So that's Perfect. wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much, Karthik. Um, and uh, yeah, hope to see you sometime soon. Wonderful. Yeah. And, you know, I think when the book is out, I will definitely come to flame, do, you know, and then I think, you know, yeah, I'll definitely spend time with you because again, there is almost too much going on in the book to even be teachable in one course, but then getting your inputs with regard to how to make this digestible for students at different levels. And then I am happy to commit the time needed to do the downstream dissemination, right? Like, mm -hmm. I mean, because in the end, the long-term impact of all of this really comes from students, right? I mean, and so I'm committed to not just kind of, you know, just like in the policy space, mm, I don't stop when I publish a paper. I spend the time trying to communicate that. Same thing here. The hope is to not just write the book, but spend the time downstream um, with, you know, making it easier for students to absorb the material. Absolutely. We'd love to host you in Pune for uh, when, you, when the book releases. We're looking forward for that. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.